Welcome to Heels in the Courtroom, a podcast about successfully navigating law and life, featuring the women trial attorneys at the Simon Law Firm. Hi, everyone. It's Mary Simon. I am joined by Erica Slater, Liz Lenevy, and Elizabeth McNulty. Today, I'd like to start with a story. I was in a conference room with a couple male colleagues. Um, I'd say this was, I don't know, two or three months ago. And it was myself and then two lawyers on another side of the case that um, I was working on. And we had to kind of come up with a plan in the case of how certain, you know, I'm I'm keeping it vague because the case is ongoing, but we had to come up with a solution to an issue that all the attorneys on the case were having. And I had, I thought I had some pretty decent um, input to give that would just solve the problem and move and move along the litigation. So me and the two other attorneys are in this conference room talking about the case. And one is, I don't know, 20, 30 years older than me. The other one is just a couple years difference between me and him. And the older attorney spearheads the conversation. And I'm sitting in the room and two minutes go by and the more senior attorney is laying out what obviously is the issue that's holding us back and pitches a long idea. And then the other male attorney starts kind of interjecting, I don't want to say necessarily interrupting, but just interjecting with additional ideas with the more senior attorney. I'll try to open my mouth and both of them just continue talking over me. And I don't know, this happens for maybe two minutes or three minutes. And I'm standing there thinking, I feel this weird sensation that I could walk out of the room right now. And neither of these two gentlemen would recognize that I left. And so that was probably about three minutes into the conversation, you know, five minutes go by and they're still going back and forth about this issue that has to do with um, one of the clients in the case. And again, in my head, I'm thinking, oh, I just don't see this being a problem and I see a solution. But clearly, you know, when I try to open my mouth, it's not it's not heard. So five minutes go by, 10 minutes go by. And eventually the conversation turns into, you know, business is over. And now there's just chit chat about their lives, prior depositions that they've had relating to each other about kind of war stories. And again, I'm standing there thinking to myself, I, should I like whistle or make a noise or clap my (laughs) hands and get the attention, break up the conversation Looking at my watch, 15 minutes have gone by. Um, as you all know, I just got back from maternity leave. I don't have time to waste. Um, if someone doesn't <laughs> need me in a meeting, I'm not going to the meeting. So I'm just standing there thinking I'm I'm not being seen. I'm not being heard. And I think I'd like to think I have valuable input, but I could leave right now and it wouldn't make a difference. So I leave the conversation. I actually said, well, I got to get going. And then the whole conversation ended because I just we were just kind of standing there talking about nothing. And I got in my car and I left to drive home. And it reminded me, I, I was thinking, you know, where is this feeling coming from? And what? why is it so familiar to me? And what does it feel like? And I had a flashback to about three years ago when I wanted to buy a car. And my husband and I went to the dealership and it was a male car salesman. And it was me and the car salesman and my husband and were there to buy me a car with, you know, obviously it's both of our money, but I'm able to, you know, put a down payment on a car for myself. I'm invested in the type of car it is. I'm the one who's going to be driving it. And there was like zero interest of my input or, or, ideas about what this vehicle should be because the car salesman was only looking at my husband. And I just remember sitting there thinking, I have a definitive opinion on the questions that are being presented between the car salesman and my husband, but I'm almost uninterested in even talking to this guy anymore because he's not really noticing my existence. And it's weird to me that I could have this, I could be so triggered and being brought back to that exact feeling a couple years ago and I can't help but wonder am I am I the only one who has these moments where I just am like man I could have just walked out and no one even would have noticed then I thought to myself I never feel like that when I'm in a room with other female attorneys in the workplace even when there's a mixed 
room of, uh, you know, male attorneys and female attorneys. I don't really feel that way. So I wrote it down in my little notebook to talk about at our podcast. I'm hoping that you ladies have, you know, some maybe similar stories to share or just some feedback to offer of how to avoid female invisibility in the workplace. And I read a little bit about it and most of the time anything like this happens and I Google it, it's like there's studies being done on it at institutional levels because it's so it's a repeat issue that women face. And that being said, today is kind of a reflection on female invisibility in the workplace. And I'm I'm hoping listeners, as you can hear my story, you can kind of put yourself in the last the last time that you've experienced something like that. And when you got in your car, my goal is at the end of this conversation, you're able to think about some things in your car when you're leaving that the next time you go in, you experience that a little bit less. Have you all experienced this? Am I crazy here? Or what what are we gonna do about it? You're not crazy. And I think it is something that I imagine anyone listening to this right now, any woman and probably many men of color as well, like you pointed out, are listening to this and shaking their head and thinking back to the time that this happened to them. I mean, Mary, as you were telling your story, the the first thing that popped into my head was one of the first trials I was in. So this was happening in the courtroom. At that particular trial, I was third chairing. So I wasn't doing a whole lot. I was, I was very green. And Amy and John were there. And this was Amy's case. She had worked it up the entire time. John was second chairing for her. And then I was third chairing. And so John's role was pretty minimal. He was there to pretty much step in if, if she needed the help. But she was spearheading most of the trial and handling the bulk of the pretrial arguments and anything that came up, the motion arguments, objections that were coming up, most of the witnesses, she was handling it. And there was a moment where the judge came out and he asked for basically all of the male attorneys. He he asked them for them by name. Come back to my chambers. I need all, all of you. And all of the female attorneys who there were, there were female attorneys on all the teams were sitting there like, are we dead? Like, are we invisible? What, what, what do you mean? Like, why, they why do you They just called need... our dads into shame. Yeah. <laughs> why do you need all the boys? But the girls want to know what's going on. And so eventually the boys file back into the courtroom and the judge is sitting very solemn up on his, on his bench. And he goes, I, I just want to let everyone know that we, we have a juror who might not be able to continue further. Her dog, she just found out her dog died. And we're like, you had to like make this big deal. And and one of the female attorneys, one of the other female attorneys, not on, not from our firm, but she goes, oh, well, you think the girls couldn't handle a dead dog? (laughs) And I just put my head down. But I mean, that was probably one of my earliest memories in this industry of there are going to be moments where someone of power, someone who is sitting in a position of power is going to come out and literally not see you. You may as well not be there and they are going to focus more likely than not. A he is going to focus most, if not all of his energy on all of the other men in the room for whatever reason. And that was something that obviously stuck with me. I still remember where I was sitting in the courtroom when it happened, because I remember looking around of like, well, why can't the girls go back there too? We could go on story after story. We could probably sit here for four hours just recounting all of the stories we all have. Or four seasons of a podcast. Or four seasons of a podcast. (laughs) About all of the incidents we've had where we have been overlooked, ignored, Or sometimes even in situations where we have voiced our opinion, it has been disregarded. And so you're not alone. You're not crazy. It's a real phenomenon. Like you said, it's being studied by all of these think tanks or academia or whoever is is doing this research. But it's, it's a real thing. It's a real problem. When this comes up the most, at least in my life, I've probably been dealing with it for all of my life. I'm the baby of my family, although I would say I'm the most responsible. But <laughs> I feel like throughout my entire life, like we'd be talking about something or questions would be asked and I would you know, either answer the question or say my thoughts on a subject. 
everyone would ignore me. And then my brother would say it and everyone would be like, oh, that's a great idea. We should definitely do that. Or yeah, I think that is the answer. And it continues to happen in my professional life. My role here at the firm, I'm a lot of times the only woman in the room, especially in her office stuff. And, you know, a question will be asked. I'll answer it. It'll kind of be asked in a different way. I'll answer it again. And then maybe the male attorney in the room will say the thing that I just said. And that is the thing that gets acknowledged or is like, oh, yeah, great idea, dude. And it's just it's so annoying because, you know, I just said that. And I I don't know. I mean, I, I'm right there with you, Mary. It's, it's incredibly frustrating to be ignored or overlooked or, you know, people just are tuning you out, it seems. And I certainly don't have any solutions to it. I think that when we see other women that happening to, there's a way to fix that. But as when it happens to us, I don't know how, you know, we can really help it without being seen as, you know, really obnoxious or like, you know, I just really need to be acknowledged today. I feel like is the thought that would come through that guy's head. One piece of this that I was looking into before we recorded was an article. I think if I'm remembering correctly, it was from like psychology today or something. And the article essentially was talking about the importance of eye contact in communication and in meetings and in the workplace. And it all had to do with dominance and who's the most superior in the room or who has the most authority in the room at high level decision making. But it all came down to people make eye contact with the person who they see has the most authority. You know, think about it in a courtroom. We all are looking at the judge when we're speaking. And so thinking about it in one way is I read that article and thought, well, I want to be someone who people want to make eye contact with. That's one way to not be invisible is be the person who people want to look at. And in that regard, there's only so much you can do if you're in a room of equal colleagues. You know, one way I was thinking is that if you have female colleagues, letting the other female attorney know of a thought that I have or an an idea that I have prior to going into the room or a complaint or something, and then getting their feedback, even if it's not in agreement with me, even if it's just an acknowledgement of the words that are coming out of my mouth, that helps because you're guaranteed to at least get the support of one other person. And, And at that point, whoever is leading the meeting surely has to hear two people talking about something, you know, so you're not overlooked. So I was thinking about relying on your other female colleagues. The second thing I had on my list was wear a unicorn head or a unicorn costume. (laughs) So that's second. So I don't know if you guys have any other additional ideas, but that, that was next. That was my number two. Definitely number two. I I would actually enjoy that more. (laughs) Great. Okay. Well, it's up there. It takes less planning. (laughs) Right. (laughs) <laughs> Mary, it's it's interesting to hear your comments. I was doing a little bit of light Googling before this episode just to see, you know, what what research is out there. And an article I stumbled across was a Harvard Business Review, which you and I were talking about before we came in here, because that's what women do before we go into meetings where we have to talk. We discuss, we plan. And that, that Harvard Business Review actually talked about um, women and intentional invisibility. And this idea, basically, just to try to summarize the article as quickly as possible, it's this idea that women will intentionally not seek out recognition where recognition is deserved because they view their job as trying to be part of the team. I'm doing it for the greater good of the team. And and I don't need to, you know, look like I'm I'm being entitled or, or anything like that. And it's in part because the way women are often perceived and the way we perceive ourselves, because this is how we have been conditioned to perceive ourselves, is that if we're too loud and if we are too bossy or assertive or seeking whatever, then it is unladylike. And you're going to run the risk of being a bitch, of being unlikable, of being unfriendly. And you don't want that because if you are those things, if you fall into that category of being unlikable as a woman, that can harm your career. And so you have to choose two options of one, not seeking out recognition where it is deserved, and that can harm your career, or two, 
seeking the recognition, being loud, being at the front and saying, look, this is what I deserve because of the work I've put in. And then getting bad feedback, getting bad feelings, bad reputation among your colleagues, even though it's not you're not coming from a place of of you're wrong, you're not wrong. But that could set you back professionally. So it, it's almost it's this tightrope women have to walk where we need to get some recognition so we can advance professionally, but we can't seek out too much recognition because then we're we're not likable and we're not going to be popular in our workplace. And that could harm us professionally. And it always goes back to, to you have to look not just within the fact that we're women, but the fact that this is even harder for women of color. And I know that something that you often see articles about are for black women when they talk about if they voice their concerns or if they voice issues that they have, raise issues that they have, they come off as angry. And so that's something that I also, I really want to make sure that we remember throughout this episode is that we're coming in this conversation, although we don't have privilege against our male colleagues, we do have privilege against our female colleagues of color and something we should should keep in mind. But that thought of entitlement is just, it drives me crazy, but it's also something that I, I struggle with of, of what exactly do I deserve? What do I think I deserve? Something that's even more significant, Liz, when you said we were brainstorming before this podcast, we were preparing because that's what women do. We come prepared to meetings. We were ready to state our ideas. We have an opinion on what the subject matter of the meeting or what the problem is going to be. It's so funny because after the the initial story that I shared with my male colleagues, after that 20 minute meeting where I was not acknowledged later that day. Um, when I got back to my desk, I got a phone call from one of the guys saying, so I know we talked about this. So you're just going to do A, B, C and D things, right? And I just said, yep, got it. The fact that it, I somehow wasn't in the conversation, but as soon as the work that had to be done was brought back to me to write it down and get it done, of course, I'm happy to do it. But man, that was, I really, what I really wanted to say was, Okay, so you definitely knew I was there. You, you <laughs> did know yeah. that I was in the room because you, you clearly remember to give me the call um, with the work portion of it. But it goes also back to what you were saying, Liz. Women do the work. <laughs> I mm-hmm. was prepared. I was ready. Had the solution in mind. But I, you know, I was happy to do the work. But it just how it played out. I was like, this is just seems a little backwards. Don't get me started on the number of times that we're asked to play secretary yeah. in situations where we should be on even footing with everyone else in the meeting. Which, ladies, we have to record another podcast episode. We'll have to do that for our listeners on not invisibility in the workplace, but invisible labor. That's often referred yeah. to as invisible labor as all the note taking and household chores of the office that just get put on women most times. Erica, it looked like you were going to say something. I did have an experience where a car salesman didn't know what to do with my wife and I. When we went to go get a car. <laughs> you can tell that he was like, he was like, who do I talk to? <laughs> you know, like completely threw him off. He's like, uh, we'll self-destruct. <laughs> I, he didn't know SOS. what to do. It, totally. Um, <laughs> so I'm sorry you had that experience. And it's interesting being on this side of it, being a same sex couple and being like, I don't know. What do I do? I, there's not a man to talk to. What do I do? <laughs> but if we're talking about like group meetings, meetings, you know, how we get prepared for things. I still think it's a good thing to get together with your colleagues, make plans, whether that's another female attorney who is an ally in that meeting, especially if you anticipate pushback or you're worried that your ideas aren't going to get heard. That's a good strategy. And you can even employ that with male colleagues too. bring them in, you know, find a it doesn't have to be gendered necessarily. And I think if we get out of that thinking, I know that that in theory sounds nice, but, you know, I would encourage any of our listeners, if you're dealing with this problem or it's been a um, consistent problem, find a male ally 
Um, we have another podcast about allies, male allies in the workplace. So <laughs> that's in season three. Maybe go back to that one. And and that's something I do too. Another strategy that I employ in meetings, especially in a big group meeting, we have attorney meetings with all, you know, 13 or 14 of us. This is something I end up doing a lot. If I see that a woman's opinion or even a younger attorney's opinion is being disregarded or not heard or reiterated by another more senior attorney, I will step in and say, well, you know, as so-and-so just said, you know, maybe they can tell us more about that or like affirm that that attorney has just made that idea. Because I mean, we've all been in that situation as women where, you know, we say something and then the guy in the room like reiterates it and all of a sudden it's being paid attention to. And you're kind of sitting there like, oh, that was my idea. And now it's being accepted. But also like flaming mad that, it, you know, no one was paying attention when you said it because um, you knew it was a, a good idea. You knew it was the right solution. The other thing I would recommend and encourage our listeners to do is think about the approach you take. Like, Mary, the story you were describing earlier of being in the meeting where, you know, 5, 10, 15 minutes is going by and, like, you just can't get a word in edgewise and no one is deferring to you. This is going to sound uncomfortable, but what about saying, I'm not being heard here, and then saying what you want to say? Because, honestly, shame works wonders sometimes when you need to use it. You're calling them out you know, making them pay attention to you, but being direct that you have ideas, that you have solutions, like I need a word in edgewise. And I would encourage any of our listeners to think about those strategies. You just have to think about them beforehand. Don't fly off the handle and, you know, accuse all your colleagues of not listening to you. But a simple phrase like, I'm not being heard, or I'd like to be heard, or, you know, give me a minute to get this out. You know, just as a preface to what you're saying, that can kind of diffuse that situation and it's a strategy for dealing with those situations. It immediately makes me think of a story. I was sitting in a meeting and I was explaining research that I had done. And unfortunately, it was a bad answer to the question. And that wasn't my fault. You can blame various courts for their opinions. That's not on me. I'm just I'm just the messenger. But I explained it. And the response I got was, no, that can't possibly be right. And then it proceeded to go to a male attorney who then said the exact same research I had just said. And in that moment, all I could do was look at the another attorney in the office who was more senior than me, kind of give him eye contact of, hey, you see this? You, I know you see this. You know what's going on right now. I know you know what's going on and kind of making eye contact with him. And sure enough, once The other attorney was done repeating what I had just said, which, you know, nothing against him. He was just answering the question. But the the one that I had been making eye contact with of the sort of like, hey, you've got some privilege in this situation. Use it. He spoke up and said, that's exactly what Liz just said. That is exactly what she just got done saying. And sure enough, the the attorney that we were reporting to said, oh, okay, yeah, Liz, I I guess I guess you are right. So, you know, that's 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 a tactic that I've used of if I'm in a situation, I don't keep my head down. If there's someone that I can try to flag to say, hey, you, you've got some, a little bit more pull here than I do. Use use some of that pull for me. That's something I am. I'm not above doing and I will do. And then similarly, you know, Erica, you were talking about if you're in a situation where you are the only one that can't stand up for yourself. It sucks because you want to, like, stand up and be like, hey, I'm here can you all see me? Like, what is going on? You may want to yell and shout and hop up on the desk and and make a scene. But the way that I have found to handle those situations is to come from a place of deference and to not make it accusatory and assume the best from people. Assume that this is not an intentional action by the person or by the people that are leaving you out of the conversation. But it's 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 an unconscious bias that they have that you are now in a position to break them up. So don't come at it from a place of anger or resentment, but coming at it from a place of I'm not mad. I'm just going to make you aware. And now we're going to fix this problem together. And so that is that's sort of what I think about those situations is just making sure you're coming at it from even though you may not believe it 
And it may not be true, but when you are verbalizing it, coming from a place of assuming the best from people and that people don't have malintent towards you. Yeah, I agree completely. And I think you can just be matter of fact if you need to get a word in edgewise or you know this is happening to you, you know, just saying like, you know, I have an idea here or can you hear me out for a minute and just, you know, totally calm tone and just go on. But you've gotten their attention without having to call them out and say, hey, no one's listening to me. And what you were saying, Liz, I mean, it just goes back to that idea of intent versus impact. There may not be a ill intention to leave you out, but that's the impact. I'm not giving anyone a pass for that. I think it is paramount for leaders to be aware of how they are treating the other speakers in the room and intentionally paying specific care to how you are bringing people into the conversation. I put that responsibility on the leaders in the room. But at the same time, you can understand that someone may not be intending to leave you out of a conversation. But of course, that's the impact. I know that if I had said something along the lines of, let me get this out really quickly, or give me a minute to get this thought out, I know it would have at least put a, it's like if bike wheels are going, it would have just put a stick right in the tires (laughs) to slap, to just stop everyone, to just okay, I've got the floor. And it's not rude. What you're saying is not rude. It's not rude at all. No. And I appreciate that. And I I do think it might be a little bit better than a unicorn costume (laughs) to try that. (laughs) Only slightly. (laughs) Only slightly. I'll bump that up to number two. But you have to prepare to do that, Erica, to your point. You have to go in with Go in with your thought that you want to get out or go in with the confidence that if you do have something to say, you're going to be able to get it out. And Elizabeth, I didn't think about the similarity between your position and my position in our families, let alone in the workplace, being the youngest sibling in my family. So there also any time that I feel like you grew up with that, you have to kind of validate yourself at a certain point, especially when you get older and you're in a workplace, you have to be the one to validate yourself because you know what you're, you're not crazy. You know what you're saying has merit. You know that you, you're giving thoughtful input to the conversation. Prepare yourself so you're ready to confidently interject and say, let me get this thought out before we move on to, I'm even reflecting in the moment right now I'm reflecting on the last, the conversation that I shared at the beginning of this and thinking Erica, a perfect opportunity for me to do that would have been when the conversation transitioned from business to let's share war stories for 15 minutes. You know, it would have been a perfect opportunity for me to, you know, I'm respectfully letting other folks get their thoughts out and not cutting them off, but making sure that it's not at the expense of me leaving, knowing that I didn't get to say anything at all. Yeah. And I've encountered where I've had to do that and practice quite a bit. I have like a grab bag of phrases that I pull out when I need to. One is in depositions or in arguments in front of the judge saying, please don't interrupt me. And then moving on. That shuts down someone trying to interrupt you or overtake your argument or throw you off your game immediately. And all you do is, you know, super calm, just throw it in there you know, please don't interrupt me and continue. And it halts things. And it's too bad that we have to have those things in our back pockets. And if you can get some of those grab bag phrases and visualize those situations, my gosh, if you need to practice real quick in the bathroom before you go in a meeting, no problem, do it. (laughs) You know, like whatever, (laughs) whatever gets you through. And I think it can help show some maturity and command in a meeting, especially if you do have something to share that's really valid to the conversation. For people who are maybe younger attorneys who work in really big firms or really big companies, if you're not an attorney, maybe read the room a little bit before you kind of step out there and you sure. know, say, say your opinions. Because not every room is a place where, you know, you necessarily need to be heard. Unfortunately, you know, in corporate America, there's certainly a, a certain hierarchy to when people need to speak or if, you know, it's appropriate. So I just I don't want people to think that we're giving them a license to just like, 
like stand on the boardroom table and like shout their opinions if they're not being heard. Great point. I was in a room with two people. <laughs> just <laughs> so we're clear. Yeah, certainly. There were I'm three just, of us. Yeah. <laughs> just, yeah, that's it, valid. Read the point, room of it. Yeah, exactly. Just so uh, for all the listeners can picture the room, it's me and and two people. So that that's where that phrasing can come in handy in that sort of context for sure. I, so wait, hold on, Elizabeth. The unicorn costume is not appropriate at the annual meeting. Perhaps <laughs> it, just, again, read the room. Just because I think that there's this negative connotation with like millennials that like need to be like coddled and like heard on every matter and just stuff like that. And I don't, I don't know. I think you have to be careful with speaking your mind at every turn. Isn't always appropriate. There are certainly forums for that in the workplace. It might not be at your company wide meeting. So again, just read the room. Certainly. Context matters. The thing that I've been working on the most over the last couple of years is to not stop talking when someone else interrupts me. That is something that I have always had a really bad habit of. I don't know if it's because I'm a woman. I don't know if it's because I'm Midwestern. I don't know what it is, but it's just this, this habit I've always had where if someone, in particular a man, interrupts me while I'm in the middle of talking, I will go, oh, sorry, and then let him start talking over me. And I think it was probably maybe the my second or third year of practice where this, start, this was happening. And I thought to myself, wait, why am I apologizing? I didn't interrupt anyone. I don't owe anyone an apology. And so what I do, what I'm trying to do now, and again, context matters. It depends on where I'm at, what is the situation, I am much more likely to pull this out if it is a man, a male colleague or any colleague who is of the same years of practice as me versus if it's someone who is 20, 30 years out ahead of me. Context matters, but I'm trying much more now. And I will also say not just age, but also when we're working cases, if I am the lead attorney on a case, I don't care how old you are, you're not cutting me off because we are on equal footing as far as this litigation goes. And that is a disservice to my client to let you have some sort of preference over me just because you've been doing this longer. With so, opposing counsel. With opposing counsel. <laughs> not with like a, your boss. <laughs> no, 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 no. Like that's if, if John Simon wants to cut me off to bring up a point in front of a judge, I'm going to let him. But if, you know, <laughs> Joe Blow from XYZ defense firm wants to cut me off while we're arguing a motion, that's not happening. That's It's different. Con again, context matters. But what I've been trying to work on now is to not stop talking. Someone cuts me off. I'm just going to continue just plowing into my point as if they're not there. If we're talking to the judge and I'm making my point, I don't care what you're going to say because I was in the middle of talking. I was I'm always respectful. I don't interrupt other people. I expect and I deserve the same treatment back. And if the judge is like, whoa, 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 you know, I can't hear both of you at the same time. That is when I pipe up again and I will say, judge, I was in the middle of my argument. I was very respectful to, to Mr. Uh, Blow over here and did not interrupt him. I would appreciate it if he could give me the same respect back. And again, it's even better if they're older than me and they do that because now I'm shaming grandpa for, <laughs> for being rude to me. I you know better. better. <laughs> you know better. Grandpa Blow. Yeah. <laughs> so that is something that I have tried really hard to work on is I don't apologize when I'm interrupted and I don't stop talking when I'm interrupted. Again, context. But in certain situations, that is the appropriate thing. You just you keep going as if they're not there. You have to keep getting your point because it's the only way you're going to make your voice heard. So the last point that I want to make, and Elizabeth, it's about something you mentioned, and it's about this idea of entitlement. And I and I agree. I agree. I think we try really hard to not come off as entitled or spoiled or whatever. And it's something that I've been self-reflecting on a lot over the last year or so. And I don't know if it's just it's coming with age now, it's coming with experience, but I realize and I want listeners who might be younger and who may not realize this yet themselves, there is a difference between entitlement and deserved recognition. When you put in the work, and, and it, this goes back to just sort of how I personally, how I was raised, my parents were very much, they were pretty conservative in how they, they raised my siblings and me, and they very much were 
like don't rock the boat, don't don't make too much noise, you don't want to get too much attention. If you just keep your head down and you work hard enough, you'll get wherever you need to go and you'll get the recognition you deserve. Just keep your head down and work hard. And and that has worked for me my entire life. But the more I'm in this industry, in particular litigation, and in particular in an industry where marketing is so important, what I've realized is that it is not enough to just keep your head down and work hard. Sometimes you have to advocate for yourself, and that is not entitlement, that is not you being spoiled, that is not you being unreasonable or difficult to work with, that is you advocating for yourself. Because at the end of the day, the person that is going to have your best interests at heart has to be you. And if you want to advance in any career that you're in, you have to be ready and willing and able to advocate for yourself. And that doesn't make you a bad colleague. It doesn't make you a bad employee. It just makes you someone with ambition and someone with goals. And those aren't dirty words. Well, everybody, I feel very um, heard and acknowledged now. (laughs) So I feel much better. And for all you listeners out there, if you're somebody who has recently experienced invisibility in the workplace. I hope that you are on your computer or phone right now ordering a unicorn costume for your next office meeting. But anyway, if any of you have a story that you'd like to share with us or have any comments for us, please do not hesitate to reach out to us at comments at heelsinthecourtroom.law. See you next week. Bye. Amy, Liz, Erica, Mary, Elizabeth, and Megan would love to hear from you. Send your thoughts to comments at heelsinthecourtroom.law and check out other legal podcasts in the Simon Law Firm Library. The Jury is Out with John Simon focuses on lifelong learning to elevate your practice. Subscribe today. Subscribe today.